is very proud to say that I am an Occidentalist against the Orientalist tradition of Europe. By placing Islam at the center, by placing my own context at the center, I want to look at the world. It's a kind of standpoint that comes up. Even though Sadiq Jalal Azam and others have warned us the problems of Orientalism in reverse. But uh, that does not make Hanafi not to talk about it. That is where modern philosophical tools of you know, strategic essentialism is, is used. Many feminists use it, for example. And that through that strategic essentialist kind of thing, a, a kind of standpoint, developing a standpoint, some, you have to speak from somewhere in the world, isn't it? And therefore that's the Islamic tradition that he is talking about. That gives him a firm footing to talk about the world so that you are not blown by the wind. But at the same time, you're open. And uh, I've heard him give lectures um, in the early 90s, Hanafi, in the English department, seminars, Terry Eagleton and others, and Hanafi, giving lectures on the questions of modernity at that time. And you could see that his own teachings on Western philosophy, uh, etc., will show you how this rootedness in Islam, that heritage on which he is firmly footed, would give him enough freedom to engage with other ideas. And most often, other ideas are now taken as a kind of closure, an enclosure that will suffocate you. How did, and you all know the political context in which there was a renewed interest in Islam, particularly in the Western world. One was obviously, and you are familiar with the 9-11 and, and later, which was a very significant moment in which, uh, you know, which was a kind of marker for lots of newer studies and understandings about Islam with all their problems and some newer kind of thinking as well. But the earlier moment was the Iranian revolution 40 years now, because I've done my MPhil on the documents captured from the American embassy in Tehran. And uh, my analysis of some 90 volumes of that for an MPhil work gave me the clear-cut idea that the Americans understood nothing about Islam. That, that can be easily said from official documents. And once Iran was lost, not only for the Shah, but for American imperialism also, then there was some need to study about Islam. And that moment was coming. Younger scholars now term this period mostly in terms of post-secular kind of knowledge, referring to Hamid Dabashi, referring to many other thinkers. Uh, who has roots in the Islamic world, but uh, works in the Western world. Uh, Michel Foucault was there in Iran as a reporter on the Iranian revolution. In 78, he was there. And to Foucault, you know, the French revolution, his own, revolution was the most significant, obviously. 
and all revolutions until the Iranian revolution in uh, modern times were secular revolutions. Whether the Russian, the Chinese, the Vietnamese, the Latin American ones or not, except maybe the Sandinistas and many others had some liberation theology within it. But that was the same period, 79. 78, 79. So, uh, an interview that Foucault published after visiting Iran, seeing on the streets what was happening, uh, he quoted Marx to write his uh, experience or to tell his experience to the interviewer. And it was published as The Spirit of the Spiritless World. That was the title. That was a quote from Marx. Marx's famous notion on religion. Spirit of the Spiritless World. Was that uh, what you are familiar with? Marx's statement on religion? No, isn't it? What is more famous? It's the opium of the masses. Religion as the opium of the masses. But Marx immediately would say it's the spirit of the spiritless world. The dialectician in him would uh, immediately take the other position as well. Uh, so, we are not talking about the Shia Sunni aspect, etc. here. We are just talking about how Islam was becoming a revolutionary idea in the later half of the 20th century, at the height of mod modern developments. With all European modernity and the American aspect of it and so on and so forth. And what is important here is that uh, what Foucault saw in the cities in Iran, in Tehran especially, was that there is a liturgy going on. It, it's an, in that Christian sense that he was describing it. It's like a grand political ritual. But ritual, it is religious ritual. how the Karbala was reenacted, how the commemoration of the martyrs, the 40th day commemoration, etc., on the streets were becoming revolutionary chants. And how the sovereign, like in the French Revolution, whose head was rolling, here no bread was there, they shall left Iran, you know, and, uh, 25th of January 1979. Nobody killed him. But in the in the French case, in both cases the sovereign was dethroned. It is true, like a Greek tragedy as Foucault describes it. The religious enactment was coming to the street. So it's no modern revolution by any stretch of imagination to him. And something else is taking over. That there is a renewed interest in Islam that was coming to the Western world. And he was pointing to us, obviously, that. And in that context, one has to confront Contemporary Islamic thinkers have to confront many things. One is the post-Cold War idea of clash of civilizations. A, an absolutely fallacious idea like clash of civilizations. Why should you react to such nonsense? But one has to. It's no more nonsense for many people. 
because it's written by Huntington and others, famous political scientists about whom you study. But it's an apology for newer assertion of American imperialism. If you have any ABCD of political knowledge, you would know how enemies can be created from the other side of the civilization. See, non-Western, he may call them as civilization, but the hidden meaning is that these are barbaric people. If you don't have barbarians, you cannot be civilized. If everybody is civilized, what is so great about your civilization? So the barbarians have to be there. And they can be easily put as enemies and you can have the whole bunch of things. And we have seen that in Afghanistan, in Iraq, elsewhere. And the beginnings are in intellectual enterprises of this kind. And a whole generation of Islamic thinkers from different parts of the Muslim world and from the Western world, which is also part of the Muslim world for your information, whether it's the United States or Europe, they have to confront these kinds of arguments. The binary between the so-called best and and the rest. But it was precisely against this that we have already talked about Wakamaulevi, that cosmopolitanism of the intellectual. We have talked about Afghani and Abdu, that bridge to newer ideas from the West or wherever it comes from. Like again in, in the Hadith, going to China for learning things, you see. That's not according to whether it's your civilization or not, geographically, but in the sense of knowledge. And you could see that Islamic thinkers could slowly come to grips with this Oppositional, oppositional imagination with the West in the new political context to thinking about the heritage and renewal. And that was forthcoming in a variety of forms. The famous uh, Moroccan thinker, Muhammad Abid al Jabri, uh, was very significant in this who wrote about, as an Islamic thinker, wrote about Arab reason. Arab reason? It's a strange idea. Uh, reason not geographically or linguistically placed, isn't it? But that is denoting specific way in which Islam has informed from its linguistic and religious traditions to the contemporary times through contributions of non-Muslims as well uh, from the West Asian North African region. How specific ways of thinking were developing in the region. And which led to him to think about modern claims of human rights, the universality of human rights. And this is true with uh, Anaim, the famous Sudanese scholar who wrote uh, a whole lot on Islam and human rights. And Abid al-Jabri was asserting that if you go into the Islamic tradition, it was not an argument for universality versus cultural relativist argument in the field of human rights. No, that was how it was seen. 
Abdullahi and Naim's work initially was like that, but later changes. Chandra Musafar's initial position in, in Malaysia was like that, but it changed. Japri was an important contributor there. He was talking about alternate universalities that one could imagine. That's where I said cosmopolitanism in that sense. Not in the Kantian sense of it alone, but the Kantian sense of cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism is also important in understanding this. When Kant was talking about Immanuel Kant on modernity, on the Western Enlightenment, he was talking about the you know humanity freeing itself from quote him. Uh, self-imposed tutelage, that's what he, so we have imposed on ourselves some kind of underdevelopment. <laughs> we are under the tutelage of something else. But modernity to him is to sta stand on one's own legs, take charge, becoming adults from the adolescence that humanity has undergone. And through that human rational entity, you become the universalist, cosmopolitan entity. The challenge by Jabri and others is not that this is European provincialism, etc. This is not universalism because the non Europeans are not involved in this and so on. That's the argument we are very familiar with. Uh, nor the slaves, nor anybody and so on. But Japanese argument is that, uh, you know, many civilizations, Islam in particular, and religions, have thought about and they are universal in character. And universalisms and its own cosmopolitan traditions are extremely significant. And for a Malayali, one need not talk about it. It's in our blood, isn't it, of that give and take between cultures and civilizations and languages. And this kind of alternate universality uh, should also be a starting point of thinking about human rights based on the Islamic idea of justice. And because in the liberal notions of rights, what misses out is the essential feature of justice. And therefore, and justice is no parochial idea. It's a universal idea, by any means. And therefore, there are very different ways of taking the tradition seriously and reworking on it, applying that ishtihad in the sense that you produce newer meanings to your own intellectual enterprise and they will contributing to the world. I'll just go into one more aspect and then stop. One of the most significant places where the heritage renewal uh, linkage that you could see, the application of reason in interpretation is to be seen, and an ijtihad is taking place, is feminist thought uh, in the region in the Islamic world in general. Uh, and again, Islamic world is very vast. And geographically, it's almost throughout the world now. And you should see, if you go to Amin Abadud and others call uh, Fatima Marnisi as the mother, the mother figure of this enterprise, her famous work, uh, Fatima Mamis' famous work on the Hadith. 
how the selection of hadith was done what about the authority and authenticity of the women around the prophet how far their words were taken seriously by the men who were collecting this and who were putting this down important questions because anybody who knows anything about islam would know that the prophet had around him very powerful women not to talk about khadija who had a very big influence on him as we know not only as a and his several wives his daughter fatima and so on and so forth and uh, who would uh, tell us that uh, khadija was then the most significant international business woman that one could think about in mecca in that trade route and from all traditions that we know and historical records that that are accessible to us uh, the kind of community that uh, the prophet built in madina in the atrik which became madina was uh, a mixed community it was not gendered uh, by any sense and if they were such powerful women what happened to their words who knew the prophet intimately and this inquiry by fatima marnisi the moroccan thinker and i consider her as one of the most important intellectuals of the 20th century whether anybody agrees with me or not is not a quest and and to go into those kinds of traditions and it's not simply a question of interpreting the tradition it's reading the tradition proper istihad in the sense of placing the islamic heritage in its entirety so that believers and others who are interested in the knowledge of islam could now gain from that kind of interpretation and this was precisely what amin abdud was doing with the quran quran and woman a phd thesis actually and this kind of interpretation the the istihad undertaken there you know wadud second book was inside the gender jihad istihad and jihad and this is a very uh, significant kind of process that is going on both within the region and outside amina wadud from the united states most of the time she she lives in southeast asia here in kerala as well as of knows well and and a very good friend of mine she stays with me in delhi whenever she comes there and you have marnisi's tradition which is very important in the islamic interview. if you ask marnisi because uh, people consider her as islamic feminist she is that old french educated uh moroccan uh, feminist you see who usually were called now as being called a secular feminist isn't it that's a new term because of the emergence of islamic feminism recently all earlier feminists have become secular now uh but when is if it's in both worlds uh, that's that's the kind of work that she has done so if you, if you ask her personally she will say i am a, a secular person but uh, if you ask any islamic feminists 
she is the mother figure as as uh, Amina Badud was telling us. So, uh, in a nutshell, what I'm talking about is this whole, uh, you know, uh, employing of the idea of tradition and modernity, heritage and renew renewal, Torahs and Tajdeed in the Islamic world is giving us a sense of not binaries, between the periods uh, or between ideas, but newer sense of looking at the world with different kinds of standpoints that one could take and link with the world. And heritage as a significant firm footing from which one could actually talk about the world. And in Islam, what is significant is that original moment as well, the beginnings, as Edward said. But always beginnings, intention and method was Said's famous work. That beginning is always important. And that beginning is not something, it's not only Adam and Eve or the Prophet himself, but it is an idea that persists. It goes on. And the whole interest in us, particularly while remembering Wakam Maulavi, is how far this renewal process is taken seriously, not by posing it against the tradition, but by revisiting the original moment at every point of time so that we take sustenance from it, at the same time rework it and make it contemporary, as I said. And that's where intellectuals can contribute, the university departments can contribute. And I hope that message will be taken home from uh, this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Asham Sabha Sangupnai, Sri Ashraf Kadakal Sangne, Shaniya. Bhagwan Naya, Jamaishan Sir, Ache Pedi Ilam Sabha Silumulla, Ache Dere Suvartukale. Nyaane, Nyangala Oda Jo Syllabus Frame Jai Indo India Workshop Pilana. ஏன்னையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையையைய
അതിനെ എങ്ങനെയാണ് നിങ്ങൾ റിനൈസൻസ് എന്ന് വിളിക്കുന്നത് എന്നൊരു ചോദ്യം പണ്ഡിതന്മാർക്കിടയിൽ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു ഗവേഷകർക്കിടയിൽ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു ഇപ്പൊ സാധാരണക്കാർക്കെല്ലാം അങ്ങനെ ഒരു ചോദ്യം അവർ ചോദിച്ചു കൊണ്ടേയിരിക്കുന്നു അപ്പൊ നമ്മൾ വക്കം മൗലവി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി പന്ത്രണ്ടിൽ ഇവിടെ സെൻസസ് നടത്തി വിദ്യാഭ്യാസ നിലവാരം അളക്കാനുള്ള ശ്രമം നടത്തി ആ തരത്തിലാണ് വക്കം മൗലവിയെ വായിക്കാൻ ശ്രമിച്ചുകൊണ്ടിരുന്നത് പക്ഷെ ഇവിടെ ഞാൻ വ്യത്യസ്തമായ കണ്ട ഒരു സംഗതി ഞാനും അതിലൊരു യഥാർത്ഥത്തിൽ എന്നെയും ഒരുപാട് ആശയക്കുഴപ്പത്തിലാക്കിയ ഒരു സംഗതിയാണ് ഇപ്പോൾ മക്തി തങ്ങൾ വായിക്കാൻ ശ്രമിക്കുമ്പോൾ ഞാനിപ്പോൾ ഈ കേരള ലിറ്ററേച്ചർ ഫെസ്റ്റിവലിൽ ഒരു ചർച്ചയ്ക്ക് പോയപ്പോൾ ഉണ്ടായ ഒരു സംഭവമാണ് ഞാനും വായിച്ചു അപ്പം മക്തി തങ്ങളുടെ സംഭാവന രണ്ട് തരത്തിൽ പ്രശ്നങ്ങൾ ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്നുണ്ട് അപ്പം നവോത്ഥാന മൂല്യങ്ങൾ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് സ്ത്രീകളുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട അവരുടെ ഉണർവിൻ്റെയും അവകാശത്തിൻ്റെയും സാറിവിടെ സൂചിപ്പിച്ച പോലെ സ്ത്രീവാദ പശ്ചാത്തലത്തിലൊക്കെ വായിക്കുമ്പോൾ അറുപിന്തിരിപ്പൻ നിലപാടുള്ള ഒരാളാണ് മക്തി തങ്ങൾ അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ കൃതിയിൽ അതെമ്പാടും ഉണ്ട് അപ്പം അങ്ങനെയുള്ള ഒരാളിനെ ആയിരത്തി തൊള്ളായിരത്തി പത്തിരണ്ടിൽ മരിച്ചുപോയ ഭക്തി തങ്ങളെ മൗലവിയുടെയും മുൻഗാമിയായിട്ടുള്ള നവോത്ഥാനത്തിൻ്റെ പിതാവായി പയനിയറായി നമ്മൾ കരുതുന്നു അതിനെ നമുക്ക് ചലഞ്ച് ചെയ്യാമെന്ന് ചോദിച്ചാൽ ആ ഒരു 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 ആസ്പെക്റ്റിൽ ചിന്തിച്ചാൽ അതിനെ ചലഞ്ച് ചെയ്യാൻ കഴിയും പക്ഷെ അതിനെ മറ്റൊരു ഒരു ഒരു മാനദണ്ഡവും മറ്റൊരു ഫ്രെയിം വർക്കിലും മറ്റൊരു മെത്തഡോളജിയിലും അതിനെ വിശകലനം ചെയ്യേണ്ടതുണ്ട് അതിന് അത് അതിൽ അതിലേക്കുള്ളൊരു വെളിച്ചം വീശുന്ന സംസാരമാണ് ശരിക്കും പറഞ്ഞാൽ സാറ് നടത്തിയത് സാറിനോടുള്ള ഒരു കടപ്പാട് ഞാൻ ഈ അവസരത്തിൽ അറിയിക്കുകയാണ് കാരണം നമ്മൾ ഈ ചർച്ചകളിൽ വിട്ടുപോകുന്ന പദമാണ് ഇജിത്തിഹാദ് എന്നത് ഇജിത്തിഹാദിനെ എങ്ങനെയാണ് ഇവിടെ സൂചിപ്പിച്ച ആ ഒരു ട്രഡീഷനിൽ നിന്ന് നോക്കിക്കാണേണ്ടത് ഇതിൻ്റെ തുടർച്ച എങ്ങനെ നമ്മൾ മനസ്സിലാക്കണം എന്നൊരു വലിയ ചോദ്യം നമ്മുടെ എല്ലാം പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് മുസ്ലിം സ്കോളേഴ്സ് ഈ ചർച്ചയെല്ലാം ജൂറി സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് അഥവാ ഫിക്കിൽ മാത്രം തളച്ചിടാനുള്ളൊരു ശ്രമം നടത്തിയപ്പോൾ സംഭവിച്ചതാണ് നമ്മളെ സംബന്ധിച്ചിടത്തോളം ചേകന്നൂർ മൗലവി മറ്റൊരു നവോത്ഥാനത്തിൻ്റെ ബിംബമാണ് ചേകന്നൂർ മൗലവി സംസാരിച്ചത് പള്ളിയിൽ കസേരയിട്ട് നിസ്കരിക്കണോ വേണ്ടേ എന്നുള്ളതാണ് യാത്രക്കാരന് നോമ്പ് പിടിക്കണമോ വേണ്ടേ എന്നുള്ളതാണ് യാത്രക്കാരന് നോമ്പ് നിർബന്ധമാണോ അല്ലേ നാട്ടിൽ താമസിക്കുന്നവന് നോമ്പ് നിർബന്ധമാണോ അല്ലേ നമസ്കാരം മൂന്നറക്ക മൂന്ന് സമയത്താണോ അഞ്ച് സമയത്താണോ അത് സംസാരിച്ച പിന്നെ ചേകനൂർ മൗലി വലിയ നവോത്ഥാന ചിന്തകനായി അവതരിപ്പിക്കപ്പെട്ടു യഥാർത്ഥത്തിൽ ഇസ്ലാമിക ചിന്തയുടെ തളർച്ചയ്ക്ക് കാരണമായ വിഷയങ്ങളാണ് ഈ മനുഷ്യൻ പറഞ്ഞുകൊണ്ടിരുന്നത് ഈ പറഞ്ഞ ഇൻ്റലക്ച്വൽ ട്രഡീഷനെ എല്ലാം തളർത്തിയതും ഇതേ ഫിക്ഹി ജൂറിസ് പ്രുഡൻഷ്യലായിട്ടുള്ള കർമ്മശാസ്ത്രം എന്ന് മലയാളത്തിൽ പറയുന്ന വിഷയത്തിലുള്ള തർക്ക വിതർക്കങ്ങളാണ് അതിലെ ഡിബേറ്റുകളാണ് അവിടെയും നഷ്ടപ്പെട്ടു പോകുന്നത് ഈ ഈ പറഞ്ഞ ജിത്തിഹാദ് എന്ന സംഗതിയാണ് അപ്പം ഞാൻ ചിന്തിക്കുകയായിരുന്നു ഈ പിന്നെ ഇപ്പോൾ സാറ് പറഞ്ഞപ്പോൾ പ്രൊഫസർ റെയ്മണ്ട് വില്യം ബേക്കറ് ഇസ്ലാം വിത്തൗട്ട് ഫിയർ എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞിട്ടൊരു പുസ്തകം 